Dialectical Materialism by Henry Lefebvre. This is part one of chapter one, The Dialectical Contradiction. Formal logic seeks to determine the workings of the intellect independently of the experimental, and hence particular and contingent content of every concrete assertion. Formalism is justified by the requirement of universality. Formal logic studies purely analytical transformations, inferences in which thought is concerned only with itself. The only value which any definite assertion has for the logician is as an example to teach by. These examples or pretexts are interchangeable. Once posited, thought moves within itself with a minimum of content ever ready to rid itself of this content and never acquiring any new content. It thus runs no risk of error. This formal thinking obeys only its pure identity with itself. A is A. If A is B and B is C, then A is C. In formal logic, the movement of thought seems to be something separate, which has nothing to do with the object being thought, says, says Hegel. If this independence of content and form were were attained, it would either forbid the form of being applied to any particular content, or else allow it to be applied to any content whatsoever, even in a rational one. Moreover, is it conceivable that there should be two completely separate logics, the one abstract, a logic of pure form, and the other concrete, a logic of content? In point of fact, formal logic never manages to do without the content. It may break a piece off this content and reduce it, or make it more and more abstract. But it can never free itself from it entirely. It works on determinate judgments, even if it does see their content simply as an excuse for applying the form. As Hegel points out, a completely simple, void identity cannot even be formulated. When the logician who has just posited A posits not A and asserts that A is not A, he is adopting the form of negation without having justified it. He is thus positing the other of A, the difference or non-identity, and is even positing a third term, A, which is neither plus A nor minus A. The term not A is posited only to vanish, but in this way, identity becomes a negation of the negation, a distinction within, within a relation. Therefore, the logical principles of identity and non-contradiction are not purely analytical. Moreover, as soon as we posit a determinate judgment, for example, the tree is green, we are positing A is B. We do not remain within the identity and formal repetition, but introduce a content a difference in relation to which formal identity is also a difference. On the one hand, formal logic is always related to the content, and thus preserves a certain concrete significance. On the other, it has always been linked to a general assertion about that content, that is, to an ontology, or a dogmatic and me metaphysical theme. Logical theories of the real, as Hegel remarks ironically, have always been much too soft-hearted towards things. They have busied themselves rooting out contradictions from the real only to carry them o over into the mind and there leave them unresolved. The objective world thus comes to be made up ultimately of isolated and immobile facts, of essences, subst substances, or parts, which are external one to another. These essences are what they are, the theory of identity having been applied unreservedly, and that is all that can be said about them. Most often the logic of identity has been linked with the metaphysic of being. Identity is seen not as a pure form, but as an internal, essential, and objective property of being. From the identity within thought, we can move on to objective identity, which characterizes the existence of every real substance. Being and each being is identical to itself and thus defines itself. Identity is therefore taken as both form and content, its own content. This aspect of Aristotelianism 
the most abstract and least profound, perhaps, if it is true that Aristotelianism <laughs> is also a theory of the individuality of every concrete being, was isolated and developed by later philosophies. Up till Leibniz, the Western mind was engaged on an heroic but vain attempt to extract the content from the form, to pass logically from thought being to existent being, that is, to deduce the world. The relationship between content and form as formal logic or informal logic is therefore ill-defined and debatable. Formal logic preserves both too much and too little content. This content is one-sided. It is in point of fact really transposed. The logical metaphysical postulate is precisely the same as that of the magical mentality. The relationship between form and content is seen as a participation. Formal identity becomes a schema of identification in this magical sense. Formal logic does not achieve its aim when it is turned against magical doctrines and mysticisms. It does not really transcend theories that are devoid of rational rigor and so remains on their level. It leaves open an essential problem and poses an exig exigency. How are the form and content to be united? Since formalism fails to do this, should we not reverse the order and go from the content to the form instead of from the form to the content? Formal logic has involved rational thought in a series of conflicts. The first is a conflict between rigor and fruitfulness. In the syllogism, even if it is not totally sterile, thought is rigorously coherent only if it keeps within the repetition of the same terms. It is well known that the induction which enables us to move on from facts to laws is not a rigorous one. Every fact, everything that is established experimentally, introduces into thought an element that is new and hence without necessity from the point of view of logical formalism. The sciences have developed outside formal logic or even in opposition to it. But then, if science is fruitful, it does not start from necessary truths nor follow a rigorous development. Logic and philosophy remain outside the sciences or only follow after them in order to establish their specific methods. They contribute nothing of their own. Conversely, the sciences are external to philosophy, either below or above it, and their methods of discovery had nothing to do with rigorous logic. The scientist proves that thought is mobile by advancing into knowledge, but the philosopher gets his revenge by calling into question the value of science. The conflict between rigor and fruitfulness spreads, giving rise to the problem of knowledge and of the value of science. Secondly, if being is what it is and never anything else, if every idea is either absolutely true or false, absolutely, the real contradictions between existence and thought are excluded from thought. What in things and in consciousness is diverse and fluid is relinquished to the dialectic and the old sense of the term, to imprecise argument and to the games of the sophist or the advocate who can please himself whether he pleads for or against. If thought is defined by identity, then it is also defined by immobility. Hence, a fresh conflict develops between the structure of the understanding and mobility, between the coherence of clear thinking and the different polarities and shifting forces of actual experience. Reason is located outside the real, in the ideal. Logic becomes the concern of a fictive being, pure thought, for whom the real will seem impure. Conversely, the real finds itself being rejected and handed over to the irrational. When Hegel set out on his philosophical career, he found reason, which is thought in its most highly developed form, profoundly rent by these internal conflicts. Kantian dualism had aggravated them to the point where they became intolerable by deliberately dissociating form from content, thought from the thing in itself, and the faculty of knowing from the object of knowledge. Hegel's purpose was to resolve these conflicts and to repossess in their movement all the elements of philosophical thought and of the mind which had reached him in a state of dislocation and dissension. 
This aim in itself embraced the method and the central idea of Hegelian doctrine. The consciousness of an infinitely rich unity of thought and reality, of form and content, a necessary unity, implied in thought's internal conflicts, since every conflict is a relation, yet one which has got to be fought for and determined by transcending the one-sided terms that have come into conflict. At the time when Hegel was being born to the life of the mind, great events, the revolutionary period, great national wars, the Napoleonic period, as well as the growth of science and of the historical spirit, the breakup of feudal society and the appearance of a new civilization, were making it necessary to draw up a vast balance sheet of culture to attempt a synthesis of all these diverse elements. As far as the search for a method was concerned, the problem facing Hegel was many-sided. In the first place, the art of argument and controversy had to be integrated with precise thinking. Argument is in inconclusive and uncertain unless it is directed by a mind already sure of itself. But argument is also free and alive, moving in the, minds, or moving in the midst of theses in terms that are diverse, fluid, and contradictory. There's a good side to the skepticism to which endless argument leads. It shows that when, in any proposition whatsoever, one isolates its reflexive aspect, it is necessarily revealed that the concepts have either been transcended or else that they are linked in such a way as to contradict one another. Skepticism is useful in that it introduces the negative element into thought. It dissolves the limited and contradictory representations that the understanding, which has the fundamental power of positing an assertion, always tends to posit as absolutes by bringing them into collision with each other. The understanding takes itself to be the absolute, whereas it is only a limited, momentary, and, so to speak, provisional power. It is thus involved in antinomies. The right skepticism criticizes and destroys common dogmatism. In a real-life argument, there is something true in every idea. Nothing is wholly or indisputably true. Nothing is absolutely absurd or false. By comparing theses, thought spontaneously seeks a higher unity. Each thesis is false in what it asserts absolutely, but true in what it asserts relatively, its content. And it is true in what it denies relatively, its well-founded criticism of the other thesis, and false in what it denies absolutely, its dogmatism. But this dialectic must be uprooted from sophistry, which tends, out of pure vanity, to break up what is true and solid and leads to no conclusions, save that of the vanity of the object treated dialectically. Sophistry accepts unfounded presuppositions. It oscillates between being and nothingness, between the true and the false, taken in isolation. We give the name of dialectic to that higher movement of the reason in which these absolutely separate appearances pass into one another, and in which the presupposition is transcended. Once it is linked to a precise consciousness of the movement of thought, the dialectic takes on a new and higher meaning. It becomes a technique, an art, and, and a science, a technique of argument controlled and orientated from within towards a rational coherence an art of, anal of analyzing the multiple aspects and relations of words and things without destroying their essence. A science which releases whatever is true in all the contradictory ideas between which the common understanding oscillates. Hegel next needed to rescue logic, the definite form by means of which thought contains something solid. To achieve this, he had to find the link between the form and a reality both fluid and diverse, and consequently to transform the form of traditional logic. He needed to start not from this form, but from the content, that rich content which was so diverse and contradictory, but which had already been worked on through thousands of years of human activity. The task was feasible. This content is already thought universal thought, since it is both consciousness and knowledge. The form of logic is part of it. In fact, it is that element of it which has been most fully developed. In Hegel's philosophy, the human mind therefore proposes to repossess all its objective products 
in every sphere, art, religion, social life, science, and history. It seeks to raise them to their most conscious form, the form of a concept, by transcending everything which divides and disperses the content, or externalizes it in relation to rational thought. This content is given, consisting as it does, of multiple representations, desires, material objects, impressions, or intuitions, nature, human experience. From this raw material, the notions that are immersed in it have got to be extracted. The content was substantial, but outside thought, while rigorous, thought remained motionless and empty. We must we must, says the phenomenology, tear away the veil from substantial life and raise it to the high degree, highest degree of rationality. To this end, reason itself must be defined by the movement of thought, which challenges, unseats, and dissolves particular assertions and limited contents, which passes from one to the other and tends to dominate them. Thus, the dialectic, the immediate relation between thought and its diverse, fluid content, is no longer outside logic. It is integrated with logic, which it transforms by transforming itself. It becomes the life and internal movement of thought, both content and form. The understanding determines and, pers and perseveres in its determinations. Reason is dialectical because it dissolves the determinations of the understanding. It is positive because it produces the universal and includes it in it the particular, says the introduction to the greater logic. Hegelianism thus raises itself to the highest consciousness, to the unity of the discursive understanding and the reflective reason, to, intel to intelligent reason and rational understanding. There is no object in which a contradiction cannot be found that is too necessary in conflicting determinations, an object without contradictions being nothing more than a pure abstraction of the understanding, which maintains one of these determinations with a sort of violence and conceals from consciousness the contrary determination that contains the first one. In this way, the negative moment which sophistry, skepticism, and the old form of dialectic isolated and turned against logical thought finds its place and its function. It expresses the movement of the content, the imminent soul of the content which is transcended, no element of it being self-sufficient or able to remain enclosed within itself. The negative is equally positive. Whatever is contradicted is not reduced to a zero, to an abstract nothingness, but essentially to the negation of its particular content. In other words, such a negation is not a complete negation, but the negation of the, of the determinate thing which is being dissolved, and therefore a determinate negation. The result, being a determinate negation, has a content. It is a new concept, but higher and richer than the previous one, having been enriched by its negation, or in other words, its contrary. It contains the other, but is also more than the other. It is their unity. It is the dialectic of the content which causes it to progress. Kant had opened up a new path for logic. He had drawn a distinction between analytical judgments, formerly rig rigorous but sterile, and synthetic judgments, without which thought can advance, but only by acknowledging a contingent fact. He was seeking to demonstrate the existence of judgments, which were both fruitful and rigorous and necessary without being tautologous, synthetic a priori judgments. In synthesis, he had already hoped to find the principle of unity between rigor and fruitfulness, but he saw his synthetic a priori judgments as pure, empty forms separated from their content, as instruments of cognition indifferent in relation to their subject matter, as subjective in relation to the object, as still conforming, therefore, to traditional formalism. According to Hegel, this dualism must be transcended. If they are developed and profoundly modified, Kant's ideas prove infinite, infinitely fertile. They turn into a new logic. Hegel did not discover contradiction. He insists on the fact that all thought and all philosophy 
even when it opts for one of the opposed terms by striving to reduce or exclude the other, moves amongst contradictions. The dialectical moment that ex the dialectical moment that expedient of the mind which finds itself obliged to move from a position it had hoped was definitive and to take account of something further, thereby denying its original assertion is to be found everywhere in every age, although not properly elucidated. Hegel discovered the third term, which results only or which results once any determination has been enriched by its negation and transcended. It is produced rigorously whenever two terms are in contradiction. Yet it is a new moment of being and of thought. Hegelian reason proceeds completely rigorously by, by determining the third term whenever there is an internal contradiction. It thus brings into being the, the determinations and categories of thought. The synthesis ceases to be an a priori one, immobilized, fixed, and come from who knows where. The Kantian table of categories was both formal and empirical, and Kant attached these categories arbitrarily to the unity of transcendental apperception, to the abstract I, without having demonstrated their necessary and internal unity. Hegel will strive to demonstrate the imminent unity of the categories and to produce them from a starting point from a starting point purified from every formal or empirical presupposition. He will generate them out of a wholly internal movement of the mind, a rigorous yet progressive sequence in which each determination emerges from its predecessors by way of opposition and resolution, by synthesis. The notion of the third term reacts decisively on the notion of contradiction, which ceases to be an absurdity, a hesitation and an oscillation or confusion of thought. The necessary conflict between finite determinations is brought to light. The relation between the contradictory terms is lucidly established. In the content and the form of thought, movement has an antagonistic structure. The becoming passes through the conflicting terms, confronts each of them on its own level and in its own degree with its other, which is in conflict with it, and finally transcends their opposition by creating something new. Nothingness is, but only relatively, within being itself, within each being and each degree of being, as its other or specific negation. The thought of nothingness in general is merely the thought of being in general. Being as isolated or in itself, which is instantly seen to be void and insufficient. Being is not, non-being is, they are by virtue of each other. In thought, as in reality, they pass into one another all the time, and are thus set in motion and enter into the becoming, or being which remains in itself within nothingness. The becoming in general is the third term, born from the contradiction whose first term is being stripped of all content, and hence without presuppositions. This unity is attained through a synthesis, and yet it is an analysis or deduction, because it posits what had been implied in the notion. Conversely, the becoming in general is primary, determinate existence, the primary in concrete of which pure being and nothingness are the abstract moments. The becoming is a becoming of, of something, of a being, and within the becoming, nothingness is the end of whatever is, a passing and transition into something else. It is a limit and a passing away as well as a creation, a possibility and a birth. Once they are joined dialectically, abstractions regain the concrete and return into that fluid unity which had been broken by the abstractive understanding. There is nothing in heaven or earth which does not contain within it being and nothingness. The end of a thing, its limit, the term towards which it tends by virtue of its inner nature, hence also its beyond, all form part of that thing. The being of a finite thing is to have in its inner being as such the seed of its passing away. The hour of its birth is also the hour of its death. For the assertion posited initially and immediately, every negation is thus the start of fresh determinations. 
In being and in thought, negativity is creative. It is the root of movement and the pulse of life. No reality can remain in itself that is isolated and detached, protected from the becoming, and immobile in the possession of being, in its own being. Every determinate existence is a relation. A determinate finite being is a being necessarily related to another being. It is a content in a necessary relation with another content, with the whole world. Each determinate existence is thus involved in the total movement and obliged to emerge from itself. It is what it is, yet at its very core it has the infinite within it. In its determination, it is a being determined not to be what it is, i.e. not to rem remain what it is. The other, the second term, is equally as real as the first. It is on the same plane, at the same level or degree of reality, and in the same sphere of thought. It negates, makes manifest, and completes the first term by expressing its one-sidedness. The two terms act and react on each other. To call a halt is impossible. The negation negates itself, and this by virtue of its internal relation with the assertion because it is another assertion, and because an assertion is a negation. Within the third term, the first term is found again, only richer and more determinant, together with the second term, whose determination has been added to the first determination. The third term turns back to the first term by negating the second one, by negating, therefore, the negation and limitation of the first term. It releases the content of the first term by removing from it that whereby it was incomplete, limited, and destined to be negated, or that whereby it was itself negative. Its one-sidedness is thus surmounted and destroyed. To negate this one-sidedness is to negate the negation and posit a higher determination. The contradiction which thrust each term beyond itself, uprooting it from its finitude and inserting it into the total movement, is resolved. The third term unites and transcends the contradictories and preserves what was determinate in them. Unity triumphs after a period of fruitful discord. The, the first term is the immediate one. The second is both mediated and mediator. The third term is immediate by virtue of the mediation having been transcended and simple by virtue of the difference having been transcended. The transcending is a fundamental determination occurring everywhere. Whatever is transcended does not thereby become nothing. Nothingness is immediate, whereas a term that has been transcended has been mediated. It is a non-being, but only inasmuch as, as it is a result arising from a being. It still has within it, therefore, the, the determination from which it arose. This world has two meanings. Sorry, this word has two meanings. It means to keep or preserve as well as to put a stop to. The thought of nothingness is thus simple, thus simply the state of abstract representation of the infinite fertility of the universe. To hypostasize being or nothingness, quality or quantity, the cause or the end is to deny movement. The dialectical reason transcends all the congealed categories of the understanding. It abolishes them inasmuch as they are isolated and thereby restores to them their truth within the total movement of reality and of thought, of the content and the form. Quality transcended is quantity. Measure, a specific quantum, transcends quantity and unites quality with quantity. Measure transcended is essence or being turned away from its immediacy and its indifferent relation with others into a simple unity with itself. Essence transcended, for it must manifest itself, being the raison d'etre, the principle of determinate existence and a, a, and a totality of determinations and properties, i.e. a thing, is the phenomenon. Once the phenomenon and the mutual relation of the determinations, properties, and parts of the thing are transcended, they become actuality or substantiality, hence causality and reciprocal action. The notion transcends reality or substantiality. The notion transcended becomes objectivity, 
which is in its turn transcended by the idea. In transcending itself, the idea merges from itself and is alienated in nature. The often of nature is found in the subjective mind, then in the objective mind, morality, art, religion, and finally in absolute knowledge, that is the absolute idea, the identity of the theoretical idea and practice of knowing and productive action. Movement is thus a transcending. Every reality and every thought must be surmounted in a higher determination, which contains them as a content, as an aspect, antecedent or element, that is, as a moment in the Hegelian or dialectical sense of that word. Taken in isolation, these moments become unthinkable. We can no longer see how they can be distinct when they are linked together or different when they are united. We cannot see how they are formed or take up their place in the whole. Thought, the understanding, is referred giddily from one term to the other until it immobilizes itself by an arbitrary decree conducive of error in a limited position that has been transposed into an absolute and hence into a fiction of error. The Hegelian dialectic seeks to restore life and movement to the sun of the realities that have been apprehended, to assertions and notions. It involves them in an immense epic of mind. All the contradictions of the world, in which as soon as thought accepts contradiction instead of excluding it, everything manifests itself as if polarized, contradictory, and fluid, all beings, therefore, and all assertions, together with the relations, interdependencies and interactions are grasped in the total movement of the content, each one in its own place, at its own moment. The network of facts, forces and concepts becomes reason. The content or world is integrated with the idea, likewise the whole of history. The totality, the sum of the moments of reality, shows itself in its development as necessity. One-sided determinations, the assertions of the understanding, are not destroyed, then, by the dialectical reason. Once it is no longer turned against reason, the understanding appears in its true light. Partial truths, finite determinations, and limited assertions turn into errors when they claim to be definitive and attempt to erect themselves above the movement. Understood relatively and reintegrated into the total movement as a moment, Every finite determination is true. Every truth is relative, but as a truth, it is located in the absolute and has its place within absolute truth. The understanding is a movement within the movement. It asserts, posits, negates, and analyzes. At a lower level, it imitates the activity of creation. It is essential to note that Hegelian logic does not abol abolish formal logic, but transcends it that it rescues and it preserves it precisely by giving it a concrete significance. Formal logic is the logic of the instant, of the assertion and the object isolated and protected in this table. Or, sorry, in their isolation. <laughs> I'm gonna read the sentence over again. Formal logic is the logic of the instant, of the assertion and the object isolated and protected in their isolation. It is the logic of a simplified world. This table, considered independently of any relation within the activity of creation and leaving aside the ravages of time, is obviously this table, while this lamp is not that book. Formal logic is the logic of abstraction as such. Language is subject to it as being a set of symbols which serve to communicate an isolated meaning and which must keep the same meaning during the verbal transmission. But the moment the becoming or activity have to be expressed, formal logic becomes inadequate. On this point, Hegel's demonstration has been borne out by the whole of subsequent philosophy. Formal logic is the logic of common sense. Common sense isolates and immobilizes qualities, properties, and aspects of things. Once the becoming or activity is involved, it is hard-pressed and takes refuge in phrases like inasmuch as or in this respect. That is, it accepts responsibility for one thought so as to keep the other one separate and true. Dialectical logic transcends static assertions, but it does not destroy them. It does not reject the principle of identity, 
it gives it a content. Being is being, the universe is one. The force of creation is the same throughout the universe. The essence in its manifold manifestations and appearances is unique. The principle of identity expresses this inner uniqueness of the world and of each being. A stone, in as much as it is, is what it is. Likewise, thought. But the identity we have just expressed is still only abstract, because the stone is not the man who thinks. The concrete is an identity both rich and dense, laden with determinations, and containing and maintaining a multiplicity of differences and moments. Unity, so to speak, is perpetually being wrested out of contradiction and nothingness. An absolute contradiction would be absolute division or immediate annihilation. An absolute contradiction in a thing or between thought and things would make any imminent activity or thought impossible. Contradiction, like nothingness, is relative to an assertion, a degree of being, or a moment of the development. In nature, it is externality, in life a relation between the individual and the species, etc. For Hegel, therefore, there is no question of destroying the principle of identity. Quite the reverse, every contradiction is relative to a certain identity. Conversely, un unity is the unity of a contradiction. Without a content, without multiple and contradictory moments, unity is void. But contradiction as such is intolerable. The dialectical unity is not a confusion of the contradictory terms as such, but a unity which passes through the contradiction and is re-established at a higher level. The contradiction is a tearing asunder, an eternal destruction, an uprooting of being from itself, a fertilization through becoming, annihilation and death. But the unity expresses and determines the appearance of the new being, the third term. Unity can never expel the relative negation and nothingness from itself altogether, but to the extent that it fights against contradiction and triumphs by surrounding the contradictory moments and maintaining them within itself, then a new and higher being is produced. The principle of identity thus becomes concrete and alive. The unity of contradictories exists only in specific concrete forms. There are different degrees of contradiction and unity. A more profound contradiction manifests itself in a more profound demand for unity. Contradiction and unity are historical. They pass through phases. Contradiction is only in itself in the pure and simple destruction of the existent. In its relation to and its struggle with unity, it is determined more concretely as a difference and a differentiation, as a passing of one term into the other and in opposition. A latent contradiction as an antagonism, a contradiction whose patience is exhausted. And finally, as an incompatibility, the moment of the resolution and the transcending. The leaf, the blossom and the fruit form part of the tree and of its end of its development, yet they mark themselves off from it with a certain independence, which even becomes a necessary separation once the fruit is ripe and able to produce another tree. From the point of view of Hegelian logic, the question, which comes first, contradiction or identity, has no real meaning. All movement is contradictory because without an imminent contradiction, nothing can move. Movement is itself a contradiction, and the contradiction propels the movement. Unity is fluid and a cause of movement. The becoming, therefore, is the supreme reality, necessitating an infinite analysis whose first moments are being and nothingness, identity and contradiction. What we have here is not Bergson's duration, a becoming without disc discontinuity and without drama, an amorphous, abstract and purely psychological movement. Hegel's dialectical movement has a determinate internal structure, a structure which is, which is itself in motion. It is infinitely rich in determinations and contains an infinity of moments. The becoming is a whole, which the dialectical reason grasps in a primary intuition. The analysis breaks up this whole, yet this analysis can be made and is not external to the becoming. It is a movement within the movement 
which it only breaks up irrevocably if it believes itself to be complete and posits absolute assertions. It determines moments within the movement which are ideal, that is abstract, but which nevertheless have a relative reality, and inasmuch as they are transcended, return into the composition of actuality. Each moment can be analyzed in its turn. As soon as we try to immobilize it, it makes its, ex its escape, leaving its other in its place, a contrary moment which is also real and also transcended. In order to analyze a particular moment, it must be taken by surprise in its fluid relationship with its other. Dialectical logic is therefore both a method of analysis and a recreation of the movement of the real, through a movement of thought which is capable of following the creative becoming in its twists and turns, its accidents and its internal structure. The normal view of analysis is that it releases, tautologically, a predicate included in the subject. If it is fruitful, as in the sciences, it breaks up this subject and leads to an element whose relation to the whole remains ill-determined. In dialectical logic, the element attained by every legitimate analysis is a moment of the whole. The analysis dissects and produces an abstraction, but dialectical logic gives this abstraction a concrete meaning. The synthesis does not exclude the analysis, it includes it. The analysis is dialectical because it leads to contradictory moments. The synthesis is analytical because it restores the unity already implied in the moments. Formal logic asserts A is A. Dialectical logic is not saying A is not A. It is not hypostasizing the contradiction or substituting absurdity for formalism. It says A is indeed A, but A is also not A precisely insofar as the proposition A is A is not a tautology, but has a real content. A, a tree is a tree only by being such and such a tree, by bearing leaves, blossom and fruit, by passing through and preserving within itself those moments of its becoming, which analysis can attain but must not isolate. The blossom, moreover, turns into fruit, and the fruit detach themselves and produce other trees. This expresses a profound relationship a difference verging on contradiction. Formal logic says, if a particular proposition is true, it is true. No proposition can be both true and false. Every proposition must be either true or false. Dialectical logic goes further and asserts, if we consider the content, if there is a content, an isolated proposition is neither true nor false. Every isolated proposition must be transcended. Every proposition with with a real content is both true and false. True if it is transcended, false if it is asserted as absolute. Formal logic limits itself to classifying abstract types of syllogistic inference. Dialectical, no sorry, dialectical logic, because it determines the content, has quite different implications. The simpler determinations are found again within the more complex ones. These determinations are obtained by pursuing the analysis of the movement as far as the moment when the content has been reduced to a minimum, and they themselves enter into, into movement once the reason has related them to each other. They are linked together dialectically and their movement rejoins the total, mov uh, the total movement. There are therefore laws of movement, guiding principles for the analysis of the more complex and more concrete movements. In every concrete content, we have to discover the negation, the internal contradiction, the imminent movement, the positive and the negative. Every determination exists, sorry, every determinate existence is, from one point of view, quality, immediate determinability or something, and from another, extensive or intensive quantity or degree. Quality and quantity are to be found everywhere. In every domain, degree, or sphere of being and of thought, every quality or quantity is concrete and they are therefore joined to each other. Every quantity is qualitative, that is, a specific measure. However, quantity and quality do not mer merge, but vary with a certain independence of each other. 
There can be quantitative changes in the being under consideration without any qualitative destruction. But at a given moment, the variation in the one re reacts on the other. A quantitative change, hitherto continuous, suddenly becomes qualitative. Hegel takes an example from the Greek philosophers. Head loses its hairs one by one, and at a given moment, it is bald. Quantity being indifferent in relation to determinability and variable as such is the aspect where invisible existence is exposed to a sudden assault and destroyed. The concept's cunning lies in grasping a determinate being by the side where its quality does not seem to be involved. In such a way that, for example, the growth of a state or a private fortune may bring about its downfall. Changes in being are therefore not purely quantitative. There always occurs an interruption in the graduality, a sudden and profound change, or discontinuity. Water that is growing colder all of a sudden becomes hard at a zero temperature. Only in this way can there be a coming into being and a passing away that is a true becoming. The theory of graduality or pure continuity abolishes the becoming by assuming that whatever passes away still survives, although imperceptible, and that whatever comes into being was already in existence, if only in the form of a tiny seed. In the true becoming, the just turns into the unjust and excessive virtue into vice. A state which grows quantitatively in population or wealth changes its nature, its structure, and its constitution, and may collapse from within because of the self-same constitution which, before it expanded, had made it strong and, and prosperous. Movement is therefore a unity of the continuous and the discontinuous, which will have everywhere to be recovered and analyzed. There is a leap, a discontinuity, a change of qualitative determination or degree, and hence a transcending, whenever a quality has reached its imminent limit, urged on, so to speak, by quantitative changes. In order to understand or predict the qualitative leap, we have to study the quantitative changes and determine the point or nodal line where the discontinuity arises. The becoming is a continuous development, an evolution, yet at the same time it is punctuated by leaps, by sudden mutations and upheavals. At the same time it is an involution, since it carries with it and takes up again the content from which it began even while it is forming something new. No becoming is indefinitely rectilinear. These dialectical laws are the first analysis and most general expression of the becoming. One might say that they sum up its essential characteristics, without which there cannot be a becoming, but only stagnation, or more precisely, a stubborn repetition by the understanding of an abstract element. These very general determinations of the becoming prove themselves to be necessary by issuing from each other and linking themselves together into a becoming. The fact that there are three, if one wants to count them, says Hegel, of these dialectical determinations is still only a superficial and external aspect of our mode of cognition. In itself, the movement is one. In this becoming of thought, by linking the categories together, the Hegelian mind descends into itself, grasping and absorbing its content. It grasps it by overcoming everything which separates or disperses, by destroying the negative element as such, and by negating the negation. Mind defines itself as the highest unity, possessing manifold aspects. As an imminent activity in becoming, it possesses its own movement within itself. It can pause it, pass over, and transcend, and then recapitulate these successive stages rationally. It produces its own movement by the negation of every partial moment, but this movement does not mean that it escapes from itself. Mind is a whole, it is the total movement. The identity which is completely full and concrete and contains all the determinations is the idea. In the dialectical movement it becomes for itself what it had been in itself i.e. virtually, moments that could be isolated and externalized, determinations that had had to be posited in themselves and hence negatively, so that they could then be negated and brought back into the true infinite of the idea. 
the ideas were covered in the content which it has deployed so as to manifest itself and so as to make the content explicit and con and concentrate it in itself mind and the idea or to be more exact absolute no knowledge are the supreme third term which contains and resolves the oppositions and contradictions of the universe the idea negates itself by manifesting or alienating itself but it negates itself in conformity with its own nature it remains itself in its alienation then recovers this nature in a multiform process law art and religion are so many distinct domains so many avenues by which mind by absorbing into itself an ever higher content comes to the possession of itself to the idea phenomenal mind related to an existing object is consciousness the science of conscious consciousness is called the phenomenal phenom blah, 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 phenomenology of mind <laughs> phenomenology is a higher psychology which deals with mind forming itself and educating itself in its concept its manifestations being moments of its giving birth to itself through itself the history of philosophy and the philosophy of history retrace the external existence of mind and its successive stages logic finally is at once the richest and the poorest of philosophical and scientific studies it cements the stonework of the hegelian edifice solidly together it is a science of thought thought being itself the determinability of the content the universal element in every content although it works with abstractions dialectical logic is within truth it is itself truth the logical movement of the concept can be found again specifically in every domain or degree